male reproductive system. The system leading to the production of male gametes is, from a physiological point of view, as complex as it is fascinating. At the basis of it is the testis, where the formation of sperm cells in the initial phase of their maturation take place. But in order for these to reach the ovum, they still need to learn to move and fertilize. In fact, these characteristics, ironically, aren't inherent to just synthesized sperm cells, but are acquired over time. Just to be clear, imagine the sperm cell as a little bird. As soon as it is born, it can't fly. It takes some time until it can learn to spread its wings. So, it will take time. In the meantime, the sperm cell undergoes a series of chemical and physical modifications along the genital pathways, enabling it to acquire the much-desired characteristics. But so far, we've seen the development of sperm cells indoors. In the transfer, they don't have all the resources, nourishment, and protection they had before. This problem is overcome by a complex system of exocrine glands attached to the male genital tract, which produce the so-called sperm fluid. This provides the correct supply of nutrients to the sperm cells and protects them until they've reached their destination, the ovum. It will be the combination of sperm cells and sperm fluid that will create the actual male semen. But let's take a closer look at this. Let's begin by analyzing the testicle. From a macroscopic point of view, it is a full ovoid organ, enveloped by a fibrous connective covering, the tunica obogenea, the capsule. From this, a series of connective bundles branch off within the parenchyma, dividing it into 250 pyramid-shaped structures, the lobules, the testicular lodge. Each lobule, in turn, is filled with blind tubular structures, the seminiferous tubules, varying in number from 1 to 4, which, for reasons of space, fold in on themselves. But this folding shouldn't be underestimated, because although the whole system of tubules covers a few centimeters of space, the entire length of all the distant seminiferous tubules covers a narrow that is equal to approximately 7 football fields. Estimated length of the seminiferous tubules of both tests equal to about 700 meters. There is definitely a big difference between a few centimeters and seven football fields, right? Besides a capsule and parenchyma, like any full organ, we can also see a stroma that is between the various seminiferous tubules. This is a simple loose connective interstice, mainly occupied by blood and lymphatic vessels, lytic cells with endocrine function, and immune cells such as macrophages, lymphocytes, and fibroblasts. However, testis isn't the only structure required for the production of male semen. The sperm cell, once out of the male gonad, needs to mature quite a bit. Therefore, it has to migrate out of the testis in order to acquire all the characteristics required for the fertilization of the female oocyte. Let's analyze this step by step. First of all, the sperm cell must reach the epididymis on the posterior superior margin of the testicle, which the newly formed spermatozoa can only access by several intermediate canalicular structures. These structures in between include the tubuli recti, by which the seminiferous tubules are connected with both ends, the reti testis and the afferent ducts that connect with the head of the epididymis. The reabsorption of some of the fluid produced in the seminiferous tubules take place during the transit through these structures. Since the sperm cell can't swim yet, this system of fine tubes also contains in its wall contractile cells that push the sperm cells towards the epididymis. So, here we can see the epididymis, but let's focus on its structure and function more in detail. The epididymis is an uneven and symmetrical structure, consisting essentially of a 6-meter-long duct that wraps around itself many times until it covers a portion of space of only 5 centimeters. Of this entire structure, we can outline a head, a body, and a tail. At the head come the still immature sperm cells from the right to testes, while from the tail runs a single main duct that carries the sperm to the prostatic urethra the ductus deferens. 
However, from this perspective, the epidermis looks like a simple depot. Actually, within it, the sperm cells undergo a series of modifications that will lead them to acquire a very important skill, the motility. From the tail then, through the ductus deferens, they reach the prostate, where they join the material of the seminal vesicles and are then transported outside through the urethra, so from prostatic to spongy. However, one important piece for the creation of sperm is still missing. Guess what it is? The seminal fluid. Why is it so important? Well, essentially, because without it, the sperm wouldn't get very far. This fluid is the result of the fusion of the secretions of several exocrine glands, seminal vesicles, prostate, and bulbo urethral glands, attached to the duct's complex. As mentioned earlier, sperm fluid is a true mix of nutrients and vitamins necessary both to facilitate the movement of the male gametes and to allow their survival along the female general tract. But the maturation process that allows the sperm cells to fertilize the oocyte is not complete yet. Do you know where it will be completed? Well, in the female genital tract. From a vascular point of view, the testis is supplied by tense arterial network, whose main branch is the testicular artery. This branches off from the descending abdominal aorta at the level of L2 and runs retroperitoneally through the abdomen until it enters the inguinal canal. Instead, the venous part is made up of a complex of veins that, ascending along the spermatic funiculus, anastomose to form an important venous complex, the pampiniform plexus. This directs all the blood drain from the testicle into the testicular vein and, therefore, into the inferior vena cava. This device is extremely important for cooling the arterial blood that reaches the testicle. The sperm cells, in fact, mature well when cold, and that's why testicles are outside the abdominal cavity. After a macroscopic analysis of the testicle, we can focus on its microscopic structure. Let's get a magnifying glass. Let's go. There are two components of the seminiferous tubule, a germinal and a somatic one. The germinal component is represented by the sperm cells in their different stages of development, precursor, intermediate, final, while the somatic component is made up of the Sertoli cells. But wait, if you're thinking that these somatic cells only have a lining function, then you're wrong. In fact, Without them, the very concept of a sperm cell wouldn't even exist. Why? Well, you have to imagine Sertoli cells as a sports coach. The team is undoubtedly the star of the matches, but without a good coach, it can never win the championship. Same thing happens in the testes. The sperm cells are undoubtedly the main players, but without Sertoli cells, which are involved in multiple stages of their maturation, they can never ever reach the ovum. The functions of the Sertoli cells are numerous, but we can look at them in detail in a moment. For now, let's focus on the general structure of the seminiferous tubule. In addition to these two cellular components, each tubule is delimited by its own tonica. This, in turn, consists of a basement membrane and a component made up of myoid cells, that is to say, cells that have contractile capacities which allow the sperm cells to move within the seminiferous tubules. As for germ cells, they are so complex that we would need an entire video only for them. So, let's focus, for now, on Sertoli cells. Structurally, they are three-shaped, with the apex pointing towards the lumen of the tubule. Numerous germ cells adhere to this apex. This contact is essential from a physiological point of view as it allows the nourishment of germ cells, which otherwise could not take place. But that's not all. As mentioned earlier, the functions of Sertoli cells are numerous. In fact, they can also take part in selecting germ cells, eliminating those in a degenerative state by phagocyting them, and as for the stimulation of the pituitary gland, it is important for the advancement of the sperm maturation process. However, we should not forget that these cells also have the basic function of lining the seminiferous tubule. By doing so, Sertoli cells make very close contacts with each other via the numerous occluding junctions on their lateral domains. 
You shall not pass," said Gandalf to Balrog. "Well, Sir Tully says, do somewhat the same thing. They become an impenetrable wall that can't be overcome even by small molecules. This wall is technically called the blood testicular barrier and provides for the division of the seminiferous tubule into two separate compartments." The abdominal and the basal one. The abdominal compartment is the portion that runs from the occluding junctions towards the center of the tubule, from the outside to the inside. It contains the germ cells that have entered the meiosis process and are becoming different, and therefore attackable by the immune system of the producing male. So, Sertoli cells help to delimit an immunologically privileged environment. This compartment is in direct contact with the tubular fluid produced by Sertoli cells. This might seem a paradox, but there is actually a real immunological reason why the immune cells do not recognize their germ cells as self, triggering an inflammatory and destructive response to the damage of the entire testis. Being haploid cells, they are unable to properly produce antigens to display on their membrane as a recognition plate. And that's why the immune system attacks them and recognizes them as not self. However, thanks to the blood testicular barrier, the abdominal compartment is completely isolated from the rest of the organism, thus ensuring the protection of germ cells. The basal compartment is the portion between the occluding junctions in the basal lamina, so it is an outer-facing portion of the tubule this time. This compartment, like the previous one, is also filled with a particular liquid, which, however, is not produced by the surrounding Sertoli cells this time, but is a blood translated from the vessels present in the basal lamina, hence the name hematotesticular. In these compartments, there are the spermatogonia, a pool of cells that are always ready to provide new sperm cells, and the primary spermatocytes, that is to say, those spermatogonia that are heading for a, even if short, life as sperm cells. When the time comes, these spermatocytes will cross the barrier formed by the Sertoli cells and pass into the aluminal compartment to continue their maturation and be fit for the long race towards a mature oocyte. How? Wasn't a blood testicular barrier an impenetrable wall? Actually, even this wall has a weak point, which can create a real, even temporary breach. The cause of this temporary breach is still not entirely clear and known. However, previous evidence shows that a possible regulatory factor in the opening of the blood testicular barrier may be seen in certain cytokine families, interleukins, TNF alpha, etc. The release by Sertoli cells and by the male germ cells themselves would trigger a momentary and asynchronous loosening of the intercellular occluding junctions, such as to allow the passage of male gametes from one compartment to another. All of this for one single reason: spermatogonia allows for the formation of new sperm cells. Thank you for watching. This video was created by School of Biomedical Sciences Agora. We hope you enjoyed it. If you are curious or have any doubt or question, please feel free to leave a comment below. If you want to find out more about us or want to support our project, click on the following link to visit our website.